If you can't move, you are a prisoner. No one likes to sit in traffic. But how do you move more people on transportation corridors that are already full at peak times? That is the question TransLink is asking all of us in the greater Vancouver area to help them address. The Transit Authority just released Transport 2050 with the aim of asking users to contribute ideas based on their experiences here and from other places they know or have used while traveling. The idea is to consolidate those suggestions, package them up, and then present them back to all of us for additional input. TransLink plans on going to the public for input three times before presenting its plan to the Mayor's Council. Kevin Desmond points out that because TransLink is more than just SkyTrain, buses and sea buses, they are seeking input from drivers, cyclists and pedestrians as well. We invited TransLink CEO Kevin Desmond to join us for a conversation that matters about the Transportation Authority's long-range plan to meet the needs of the region over the next three decades. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been wanting to have this conversation with you for quite some time because I think, you know, it's really easy to overlook the value of the transportation, the overall transportation system and the way that it's all interconnected. We can look at TransLink as being one thing, but it's not isolated because it's part of an overall system. And since you've come here, you've said, okay, it's time for us to sit down and come up with a long-term strategic mm -hmm. plan. What is that vision and what do you want from citizens of the area? Well, great question. I don't have the vision. The okay. citizens are going to give us the vision. That's exactly what, what I think we need to do. I could have my own personal point of view. That's my personal point of view. It mm -hmm. might be informed because I happen to be in this business. I happen to be in charge of TransLink. But with our Transport 2050, our, our long-range plan update, we want to hear from everybody. We want to hear the, just the, the absolute multiplicity of ideas. No idea is a bad idea. At the end of the day, we'll filter the ideas through a, both a public engagement process and ultimately with our policymakers on what really is going to make sense for the next 30 years for this region on mobility. Mm -hmm. Mobility kind of writ large. It's not just more rapid transit or more buses, obviously, with the pace of technology change, what's going to happen with, with ride hailing and shared services, what's going to happen with automation, what's going to happen with electrification. So it's an all-in kind of exercise. What we do know is we're forecasting over a million more people here over the next 30 years or so. We do know that there's not going to be a lot Into the whole of, greater Vancouver yes, area. Yes. And, ju and that's yeah. just in our service area, in the TransLink service area. That doesn't even include the Fraser Valley, for example or up the Cedar Sky Highway, up towards Squamish and Whistler. That's just within oh the current TransLink service yeah. area. So what we do know is we're not going to build a lot more roads. No. There's not going to be a lot more road capacity. We're very hemmed in. Most of the land is developed in one form or another. doesn't leave a lot of room for building roads. So we've got to maximize the mobility within a capacity that exists today and hopefully build more high-capacity transit in the meantime. But how do we do that? when there's already established infrastructure that is like bulging at the seams already? Like how do we find that mix that's gonna work and build it and hopefully ultimately maintain it so that it stays there? Uh, you know, uh, two, two answers to that question. One, I'll, I'll, I'll use a little jargon, transportation demand management, something, you know, we <laughs> That is jargon, okay, what does it mean? <laughs> Once, so if you've got, everything's, bulging at the seams. You've got, there's only so much capacity within the curbs, or if you include the sidewalks, or on the highways and mm -hmm. so forth. So the idea is how do you maximize the ability to move people and goods in that same bit of pavement? So that means more pe people carpooling, for example. Just imagine on the, on the commute on Highway 1 every morning, let's say every single person who drives alone in their car was carpooling with someone else. Simple math, you have half the cars on the road. Mm -hmm. So how do you get more people ride sharing? How do you get more people taking buses, taking high capacity transit? Can we make effective carpool lanes all the way out, you know, on Highway 1 all the way into Vancouver, for example? 
Um, so on the one hand, you got to manage the demand on your roadways. You mm -hmm. can manage it by, by demand um, incentives or supply incentives. The second piece is, how do we expand our rapid transit system, our high-capacity system? Um, I personally believe, and I, I think you know, most would, would assume, that, we've, that we, that's the quickest and most efficient way to move a lot of people. You're always going to, if you have um, a dedicated, exclusive right-of-way, such as SkyTrain, you can maximize the ability to move people really, really efficiently. Now, it takes a long time to build projects like that, and they cost a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I think that's why we need a lot of public engagement. We want the public, at the end of the day, to feel like they own the plan. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, once the plan is then adopted, we're going to have to go back out to the public and say, okay, this is your plan. Now, how do we, how do we implement it? And implementing it means, among other things, raising the money for whatever the ideas uh, are. Or it could also be regulatory changes, legal um, issues. You know, mm -hmm. How do you sort of think about the world, the, the oncoming world of automated uh, and shared and electric vehicles? There probably are going to be a new regulatory framework to make that work for us. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a no quick problem. commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is brought to you by Audlem Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Audlem Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started this show. Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. And of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a show like this one, I suggest you reach out to Oh Boy. They can help you produce it, and they can help you build your audience. And we also need your support. I ask you to please pledge $1 per show by going to conversationsthatmatter.tv slash donate, because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce this show. Now, back to the show. So there's a, uh, I want to go back to the bit about the roadways first, and then we'll come back to expanding resources through uh, transit. Because I think that a lot of people don't understand what the relationship between TransLink is and our roadways. Like when we take a look at the Patello Bridge and what's going to happen there, they don't understand that TransLink is going to play an important role in how that gets played out. And so when you talk about saying, well, how do we create that kind of ride share, which... On the top of my head, I think, how do you do that? Especially when we have a culture, I'm sorry, I'm rambling on here, but when we have a culture where people are uh, said, well, I bought a car because it gives me autonomy. Now you're telling me that I'm going to be wedded to somebody else's schedule and I'm going to be driving with right. them. How right. do we do that? And how does that fall under the umbrella of what TransLink brings to this overall equation? Well, you know, when TransLink was created 20 years ago, we just turned 20 in, in April, as a matter of well, fact. Well, happy anniversary. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, the folks that wrote the, the TransLink Link Act um, had a vision for a singular organization that would not only deliver public transportation services, but would also be the larger go-to planning entity. And, and I think we need to embrace that role. And, you know, one of the things that the general public probably doesn't know much about, we, we co-manage what we call the major road network. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the roads. So all the arterial, uh, arterial roads in the, in the region, not the major highways, but the arterials, we kind of co-manage it with mm -hmm. the uh, cities. We help fund it. And with that comes certain amount of regulatory authority in terms of goods movement and, and how the, how the um, streets and, and those roads uh, can be changed and adjusted over time. So we can, we can have sort of this umbrella overall view using modeling data, future um, projections and so forth to try to understand how you get the most out of your capacity. How do you create mobility options? We're not all about you must take the bus mm -hmm. or you must take the train. It's how many options can we give you so you have the choice to select the best option for whatever your travel need is. If it's going to work, if it's going to school, if it's going to a show at night on Friday night or something, it, in my ideal world, you have a lot of different choices. And if driving alone in your car or with your, with your family in the car is the best way to get around, ideally a lot of other people are choosing another way to get around so you're not stuck in traffic. Mm -hmm. So in the mix of that, like having control over all of those like arterial road networks, there is the movement of goods and service people to help fuel the economy. When we think of transit, it's usually 
individuals were saying, okay, you make a choice to get on the bus or SkyTrain or CBUS or whatever it is, that's your transportation, you're going to work or for some sort of personal need. This means that your authority also plays an important role in in understanding what the movement of uh, of goods and services yeah. is, and how do we ensure that that can happen efficiently? Because that all goes to the cost of living in the region as well. So we participate in a, in a couple of uh, very important bodies. One is the the Gateway Council. The Gateway mm-hmm. Council it's it's the Port of Vancouver, YVR, um, shipping industries, the railroads, uh, the province, uh, and some of the municipalities focused on international trade and goods movement. We created something called the Greater uh, Vancouver Urban Freight Council, uh, which, which translate um, chairs, which is focused on interregional um, goods movement. Part of our mandate at TransLink is the movements of, of goods as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, so the more people that we can get off of driving alone in their cars because we're providing good choices, mm-hmm. the more we can free up road space for uh, moving goods. We believe that the port and all the goods movement in our gateway port here in this region is very, very important and vital uh, for the economic success and prosperity of this region and therefore the quality of life of the region. So we need to partner and join with all the freight uh, movement um, um, interests to understand how we can make sure there's a good balance between moving people and moving goods on our very crowded byways. It's an integrated system. Absolutely. But Part of that is the fact that there's what, 22 different communities that sort of fit within that greater port uh, environment and then the gateway system. Mm-hmm. Um, how then do you manage those relationships? Because they're changing all the time. You know, new mayors are elected and then they come along and say, I don't want that part of the plan anymore. I want something different. How do you manage that and, and, and with a long-term strategic view? Well, I'll give you a little, it's a, it's a really small example, and it's not something the average citizen's ever going to think about. I didn't think about it before <laughs> I got here. Each of those 20, the 21 municipalities 21, yes, thank you. could have different <laughs> rules and regulations associated with the weights, the weight and, regula- and regulations of trucks within their, their cities. So you could go between Vancouver, Burnaby, New West, and Surrey and have four different regulatory environments for your truck. And you might have a different, have to get a different permit from all four of those cities, wow. depending on the size and the weight of your truck and whatever goods. So we took the initiative through the Greater Greater Urban uh, Freight Council to harmonize all the regulations. And and I hope by the end of the year, we're going to have complete harmonization of all those regulations. Now, how did we pull that off? We got everybody together. We we understood what a common interest is. um, And then let's work towards a common interest. It actually isn't very hard to do. The governance of of TransLink is in part by the Mayor's Council. So Mm -hmm. we have all 21 cities uh, and the Tawasin and and electoral area A, so 23 um, entities, they all sit together and we make policy. And we we work by consensus ultimately so that there's a common approach and a common objective. So yeah, the different cities might differ on various different approaches, but at the end of the day, if we work well together, generate that consensus towards a common objective, prosperity, quality of life, movement of goods and services, you can actually make good things happen. But it, it takes work and it takes a lot of consensus building. So how then do you also work with those 21 different jurisdictions and say, okay, uh, you're planning out your city or your municipality and you need us to provide transit services for those who aren't driving. Um, how do we help you make decisions that are going to reduce the requirement for longer trips uh, and do you play a role in helping to do that kind of planning? Because you can't have constant bus service everywhere. The region's right. too large. Oh, yeah. Well, so we're, we're right now within the, the second phase of the mayor's 10-year plan. So in uh, November of 2016, uh, the, the mayor's council, with a lot of funding from the province and the federal government, started the first phase of the project. And the first phase of the mayor's vision was fundamentally get a lot more bus service out as fast as possible, get more sea bus service out, get more bus service out, get more handy dart service out, which we did in, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, last summer, almost a year uh, ago, uh, the mayor's council and the board adopted a $7.3 billion, very, very aggressive plan to expand the system that funded the Broadway subway. It funded the light rail project uh, in Surrey, and it funded a multi-year um, uh, program to dramatically increase the capacity by about 40 percent of the Expo Millennium Line uh, mm-hmm. program by buying more uh, fleet uh, primarily. 
So we're now funded to about $9 billion of expansion. Um, next year, hopefully around this time next year, our policymakers, I hope, will adopt the, the third and final phase of the 10-year plan. It will complete the south of Fraser, the, the Surrey um, Rapid Transit um, Program, more bus service, and perhaps other projects um, as well. A lot of what we have to do is improve transit service south of the Fraser River. Yes. That's where people are living. Mm -hmm. That's where it's more affordable. That's where we do not have good enough transit service. So we've got to catch up. Vancouver has really good transit service uh, for the most part. New Westminster and Burnaby, abundant transit service. Surrey, Langley, Delta, um, and the Tri-Cities and, and Pitt Meadows and um, uh, Maple Ridge, not so much. So we've got, to, we've got to move as quickly as we're able to to make the right investments to, to catch up for those communities. You know, Surrey in the next couple of decades is going to be the largest city in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of people living there. We need to work with the city to get rapid transit, high capacity transit. And they've got to figure out their land use planning as well because they've got to figure out ways to densify around the transit assets. Is, I know $9 billion is a lot of money, but is it enough? No. When, no. And so then how do we put together the kind of funding model that's going to support this? Because it won't solely come through ridership. I know that there is tax on uh, gasoline consumption and so on. But still, the funding, we need to figure out what that model is to ensure that if we're building this, we don't run into roadblocks to bring it to a halt or prevent us from being able to maintain it. So, a variety of, of answers to the question. First of all, you need partners. Mm -hmm. First partner is the federal government. So, the, the uh, Trudeau administration in 2016, right after I got here, so the timing was great, announced their public transportation infrastructure fund, nationwide funding of $22 billion, of which this region got $2.6 billion. Um, for our funding. It was the first and biggest um, kind of allocation system, from a systemic uh, uh, standpoint nationwide for public transit over a 10-year period. So we need the federal government in this country, and, and my belief is to have ongoing 10-year programs. Mm -hmm. We need another 10-year program. It's something we're, we're talking to Ottawa about. We're talking to various different parties about, you know, in the upcoming uh, federal election. You also need the provincial government to continue to be a very, very strong supporter and funding uh, source for the system. So that $9 billion on the capital for the big projects, about 35% of that comes from the federal government, 40% mm -hmm. of that comes from the provincial government, and then the region comes up from the rest. So you've got to have those partnerships. If it was just on the region and collecting resources from the region, we couldn't do it, number one. Number two, we need really, really strong public consensus. And that's why it goes back to 20, uh, and that transport is the key, 2050. Isn't it? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And we need to get out. We need to talk to the public about what are your dreams? What do you want to see happen? And it's sort of what sequence. And then people are going to be much more willing to then fight for the same resources that we're fighting for politically and bureaucratically because we're all sort of marching to the same tune. Yes, let's get high capacity transit in, in Surrey. Let's figure out how to fund it. And then, yeah, if it takes more tax dollars or more fees, if people know where the money is going, mm -hmm. and if people accept that that is going to be a, a net positive for their life, and even if it's a few years out, you know, my experience, particularly in the Puget Sound, where we go out to referendum all the time for these things, people are willing to say yes. They're willing to, 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 to take that a uh, little bit of, um, of hit in their pocketbook because they see something um, positive going forward. It's our job at TransLink and my job as the CEO to make sure that we're transparent and accountable and that we are good to our promises to deliver. And then I think the taxpayer feels pretty good um, and pretty confident that their dollars are being used for a good purpose. But that consensus right. building means a lot of public engagement. And so thus the Transport 2050 program where you are reaching out to people because we've tried to uh, change funding models in the past here and it met with resistance. And I think it's for the very reason that you point out there wasn't a clear vision of what right. am I going to pay for. Yes. Um, and that, I, that's, I've seen that play out over and over. You know, I'm from the United States, and I've, I've been in transit in New York um, and, in, and in this Seattle region. And what I've seen, and with my colleagues elsewhere, if you're, if you're very upfront of what it's going to be used for and, and you're a solid, respected delivery organization, the taxpayer is going to be much more likely to support what you're doing because at the end of the day, nobody wants to sit in traffic. Nobody does. Nobody wants to sit in traffic. Nobody wants to see their free time progressively eaten up by longer and longer commute times. People want solutions. They want answers. Uh, and that's kind of a bipartisan thing. It's mm -hmm. just, hey, it's quality of life. Quality of life is not a, is not a partisan political issue. It's all about, you know, what's, what's going to be good. I go back to that, that, that issue of choice. 
you and I have different choices and we can make the choice on how to get, we took the train here uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the interview today. It was the most efficient way to get around. I just want to, I want, yeah. to, I want to promote to the general public, help us figure out the plethora of choices and then we'll develop a plan that will meet those, those various different ideas. The train is incredibly efficient. I used it yesterday to go to a meeting at the Vancouver Sun, uh, way easier than, than driving and far less expensive. The question going forward, I think, for people when they look at, at this initiative, they're going to say, will my voice really matter? Um, like, is this a public relations exercise or does my voice really matter? And how do you give them assurance that, yes, we do want to hear from you because without that, we're not going to be able to make the appropriate planning choices? Um, yes, the public's, uh, the public's voice will matter. As I said it at the outset, no, I, at the start, no idea is a bad idea. One of the cool things on the website, on the T2050, um, Transport 2050 website, is you can post your ideas and people yes, can I basically like yeah. your ideas. And I, I was just looking at, at some of the stuff um, yesterday. There's, you know, the top ideas have 30, 40, 50, 60 likes. Mm -hmm. And actually, none of them are bad ideas. All of them make perfect sense. They, you know, um, um, how do you make buses move faster? Expand the SkyTrain system, you know, of the like. How do you mm -hmm. improve the, the capacity of, of the highways? So we're going we're gonna to pull those ideas and we're going to extract those ideas, get a sense of what's sticking, where, where you know, a lot of people are gravitating to, towards those ideas. The good thing is they don't really diverge a whole lot from what planners at TransLink may think or our, our, our politicians may think. And I, I hope in the final plan, the majority of the public that engages with this will see a plan and they'll go, makes sense. Yeah, because then, as, some... to your point, they will then get behind it. Yes, yes. Because they, the, it yeah. will reflect... The, the input that they've offered over a period of time. I, we're not going to have a plan that's developed by, uh, by bureaucrats. We want, we want a plan that ultimately the general public can say, yeah, this is part of the fabric of how we see our community developing over the next couple decades. And so what is the length of time? How long do people have to be able to offer uh, their thoughts and ideas? So we're, gonna, we're doing the, um, uh, the public engagement in three stages. So this is really the big stage we're in right now. Uh, started uh, uh, earlier in May through the end of the summer, through early September. Uh, the website's going to be open. Um, you can, uh, we have a poll, um, some, some um, uh, a survey. You can mm -hmm. answer a bunch of questions. As I mentioned, you can throw out your own um, ideas. We're going to be out in, in as many community forums for face-to-face -face contact as much as we can. We'll get most of the input, I'm sure, online, but that face-to-face -face contact is absolutely invaluable. So we're going to be as many community events this summer as we possibly can. We'll then um, pull all that information together in the fall. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll see how to, how to assemble it, how it makes sense. We'll work with policymakers. We'll then assemble it into sort of a first cut. Here's some ideas based on what we heard. And then early next year, we'll do a second round of, of public engagement. Mm. Okay, how do we, how, how, how's it looking? You know, this is what we heard. How do you want to further shape it? And we'll do a final round of public engagement uh, probably in the third quarter of next year before we finalize the plan. So the public will have three chances to right. weigh in. Yeah. yeah. The final chance will be, here's kind of the draft final document. Here's a final chance to help shape it. Well, without effective transportation, we're, built, we're blocking ourselves in, and that's the last thing we want. Thank you very much for coming okay. and sharing this. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me.